Before I get started, I wanted to let you all know that all of you can get that you can get the slides and the bits of code that I'm going to be showing today. It's going to be available on the CHOP GitHub after the presentation. And there's also going to be a recording of this talk. So there's no need for you to take notes. I also wanted to mention right here that for today's talk, I have borrowed extensively from Garrett Grohlman's excellent Shiny tutorial. So if you guys have seen that, some of this is going to be a review. But if you haven't seen it, you definitely should. And I'll mention the tutorial again in the references. So this is going to be an introduction to Shiny. And uh, it's going to be a little more technical than some of the other talks that have been given here in the Chopper users group. And just for the purposes of this talk, I'm assuming that you're familiar with basic concepts in writing R scripts, such as variables, functions, lists, and installing and loading packages. And that's because a Shiny app is basically a delivery vehicle for your R script. So you could write an R script that does a certain thing, and all a Shiny app does is allow you to make the function of that script available to people who don't know R. All they need to do to do the analysis that, that you want them to be able to do is to be able to click on a website. But you, the developer of the app, you will need to know how to write the R script that you have in mind. And I'm also going to assume that you're familiar with the idea that a web application is hosted on a web server that sends pages written in HTML to your web browser and finally, I'm assuming that you're interested in learning about how you can use Shiny to build interactive web applications. Now that said, that some of you, no doubt, will feel like you don't know R well enough for any of this. Uh, but no worries. I want to point out a number of excellent free resources that are available to you to get you up to speed. The R for Data Science book by Garrett Grohlman and Hadley Wickham has become sort of the de facto standard introduction to data science with R, with best practice and ease of learning in mind. And the entire text is available for free at this address. It comes with lots of exercises, and there are solutions to the exercises available online also. If you are a CHOP or a PEN, and I think everybody in this room is, but if you're viewing this talk later online, maybe you're not. But if you are a CHOP or a PEN, you can take advantage of, this, of a series of free R workshops that are going to be customized to your personal needs. And they're created by Sheila Brown of the Arcus team. And you can find more about, uh, about that by going to a-mass.org or by talking to Sheila. And I think I saw her earlier. So, or maybe, maybe Sheila. She'll be back. Oh, yeah, she'll be back. Um, and finally, if you're at CHOP or at PEN and use R at any level whatsoever, I really encourage you to join the CHOP R user group. We are a friendly and inclusive interprofessional community and provide a forum to get technical help, to learn, and to socialize. And if you'd like to get an invite to our Slack channel and invitations for future talks, please go to bit.ly slash chop r and enter your chop or pen email. That said, even if you feel like your R skills are a bit rudimentary at the moment, I think that you will still get something out of this talk. Um, I think it'll leave you with a sense of what programming Shiny is all about. And, uh, and how it will be useful for your work. And since this presentation is going to be recorded, you can always come back and, uh, and take another look later. So what I'm going to show you today is how to build a very basic Shiny app. We'll go into some detail to understand the Shiny reactivity model and programming patterns. And then we'll deploy the app afterwards. And finally, if there's time, and um, we'll add a bit of styling to make the app look chop branded. The app that we're going to make today won't be very exciting or pretty or powerful, but that's not a limitation of Shiny. Uh, in fact, at the end of the talk, I'm going to point out some resources that you can peruse to build very sophisticated apps and with highly customized appearances. So let's assume you do know R, and now you want to build a Shiny app. The first thing that you should do is to understand the architecture of a, of a Shiny app. And to do that, we'll look at a real Shiny app. So this is a Shiny app. It's pretty simple. It shows some de-identified data from a project that looked at the central line associated bloodstream infections, or CLABSEs. And what's shown is a histogram of the total number of CHOP patients with central lines on a given day throughout the study period. What you'll notice is uh, that this uh, app runs inside of a web page. This is the Google Chrome browser. And inside the app, you can appreciate that there are some components built with R. So this plot over here is made with R by calling the ggplot command. 
And the plot shows data that comes from R, the Clapsy data set, which is part of the ROCQI or Rocky package. Uh, you can also see that some parts of this page can be manipulated. We have a slider over here that's labeled number of bins. And when I change that number with the mouse, the app automatically gives me a new plot with the request number of bins in the histogram. To make this page run, there's a computer working in the background to update the web page whenever necessary. And this computer is running an R session that's just waiting for me to interact with the web page. And whenever I make some change to the web page, the computer reruns some R code to build a new plot and sends that plot to the web page. So to put this visually, every Shiny app works like this. There's a web page that the user visits, and there's a computer that runs an R session and creates the web page. Right now, the computer that's running R and serves the web page is just my laptop right here. So the web server is running locally. Even though the Shiny app is shown in my web browser, that doesn't mean it's coming there from the internet. It's just coming there straight from my computer. If you want to share the app on the internet or on the CHOP intranet, all you have to do is put the app onto a remote web server that allows outside clients to access the app. So what does this mean for you as a Shiny developer? Well, when you make a Shiny app, you need to make two components for each app. For the user interface, this will be a web page that the users will see. The user interface is really just a web document written in HTML, but you don't really need to know any HTML. We will generate this document from R. The second component of your app will be a set of instructions written in R to tell the server how to build the output objects and how to react when the user changes input objects. So let's take a look at our app. Here's the R code I used to make it. You can see that the code you can see that the code defines a UI object. And the code inside of that component right here is what's building that web document that's sent to the browser. Oh. Now, if I copy that code uh, and paste it into my console prompt, you'll see that all that it's doing is, is to make a bunch of HTML code. And this is the HTML that the app will send to your browser. Let's go back to our code. The second component is what's called the server object. This defines a function with all the instructions that the app needs to build that plot. And finally, over here, you see a command that binds the UI and the server together and serves the Shiny app. And this is the command that's running in the background and keeps my, keeps my R session busy. Now that we've gone over the architecture of a Shiny app, let's start building a Shiny app. And whenever you do this, you will want to start with the template. Here's the template. It's three lines of code if you don't count library shiny. The first line of code uh, sets up the UI object. The second sets up the server object. And the last one binds the two together into a Shiny app. This piece of code is worth memorizing. Or alternatively, you can download it from the GitHub link, which I'll circulate after the talk. So the template is in the 01-template file, library shiny, UI, server, shiny app, three lines of code. This is actually the shortest possible Shiny app, so let's run it. To do so, I can copy and paste the code in the console. And when I hit Enter, our studio will launch the app. So this is the shortest possible Shiny app. So you can see we've made an app that shows a blank page. We didn't get any error messages, so that's great. So we know it works, and that's a good foundation to build on. So let's add some things to our app. If I want to add elements to my user interface, I just add them inside the fluid page function. For example, I can write hello chop and then rerun the app. So now my app says hello chop. And one thing that I want to point out is while the app is running, you can see down here that you're getting that, that the console gives you a message saying that's listening on some port of your local host computer. And also 
it doesn't give you your command prompt back. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, the app is, is now hanging out in my R session and waiting for user input so it can react to it. And that means that, um, that if I want to get my command prompt in my R session back, I need to terminate the app. So now that we've, we've looked at the Hello Chop app, I'll run that, and we can see that it says Hello Chop. That's very cool. Uh, it's a little bit rudimentary, though. I wouldn't say very cool. I think it's very cool. Okay. <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> so let's add some inputs and outputs to the page. <coughs> so as you build your Shiny app, a good way of thinking about developing it is in terms of inputs and outputs. Inputs are the things that your user can toggle or use to provide values to your app. In our app, we've, we've one input, a slider that the user can use to select the number of bins to use in a histogram. But we could have many more inputs if we want it. Outputs are the R objects that are generated as a result of the inputs. These could be plots, tables, texts, or other things. They are the things that should respond when the user changes an input. And here's how you add inputs and outputs to your app. In both cases, you add the inputs and the outputs to the fluid page section of your template. Anything that you put inside fluid page will end up on the user interface of your app, and the inputs and the outputs are what we, end up, what we want to end up inside the user face of our app. So you can use inputs with input functions, so you can add outputs with output functions. And by the way, some of the stuff that we discussed today can seem very new and unusual, even for, if you're an experienced R programmer. So at this point, I think a good way to think about the patterns that we're going to look at is that this is just the way it is, and it'll make more sense once you start to take a deeper dive into Shiny and to reactive programming. So let's look how to add an input function. Slider input is an input function that will build a slider object, like the one we've seen in the, in, in the Clapsy app. So if you ran this code uh, on the console prompt, this is what you'd get a piece of HTML that is so, that's associated with some CSS classes that in turn run some JavaScript. And when you pass the slider input function as an argument to the fluid page function in your template, this is what it adds to your Shiny web page. So if you take our template, so this is the three-line template. I just added some new lines here. And you add the slider input function as an argument to fluid page, it'll build the app you see over on the right. Well, this is just a PowerPoint slide, so I, so I can't actually move the slider right now. But if I ran this in R, you'd see that I can manipulate the slider and change its value. Here are most of the input functions that you can use in your apps. You can see that most of them end with the word input, uh, which is why they're called input functions. So you can add buttons to your app, checkboxes, dates, date ranges, radio buttons, drop-down menus, sliders, text number, and password inputs. Basically, you can create any sort of interactions you might want a user to be able to make uh, on your website with input functions. Each of the input functions follows the same basic syntax. They take an argument named input ID. That argument allows you to assign a name to an input, which is important to connect it to the outputs, as you'll see later. You can give your input any name that you like, but each input in your app should have its own name. One thing to notice is that the argument name, that this argument name has a lowercase d on the end, so if you use an uppercase d, here you'll get an error. The second argument that every input function takes uh, that's a required argument is the label argument. When users see your input object, like a slider or a button, they won't necessarily know what the slider controls or what to do with it. So the label provides you with a way to explain that. The labels will appear in an intelligent place uh, near the object. For a slider object, for example, uh, the label will appear right above it, but on an action button, it will be you know, the label of the button. If you don't want a label to appear with your input, just put two quotation marks here on an empty character string. And then finally, each input function takes additional arguments that help define how the input object should do its job. For example, a slider input object needs to know its minimum value, its maximum value, and initial value for the slider. But those arguments wouldn't make any sense for an action button, uh, and so on. So if you want to know what specific arguments to use with the specific input function, you can just look at the help page for the input function. If you type a question mark slider input into your console prompt, it'll pull up the help page for slider input, 
where it'll tell you all the different options and arguments for that particular function. Now let's look at outputs. Outputs are things like plots, text, the, the kinds of objects that you generate with R. And similar to the input family of functions, Shiny provides a family of functions that are called output functions because they all end with the word output. Just like input functions, you can pass these functions to the fluid paid function to make them part of your UI object. You can see that there are dedicated functions to place plots, tables, text, and other things in your app. The syntax of output functions is similar to the syntax of input functions. Notice how in the beginning of the function name it tells you what kind of an object you want to place in your app. To create a plot object, that output function is called plot output, in, as in camel case. And then each output function takes the argument output ID, uh, where you specify the name of the output object, and that's a required argument, and that's the only required argument of output functions. You can use any name you like, but each output object should have its own unique name. Again, note that the D in output ID is lowercase, but in actuality, since output ID is the only required argument in output functions, people will often omit output ID equals for conciseness. So let's add an output function to our app. Say plot output hist. Hist is the name here, and we don't have to write output ID equals because it's the only required argument to plot output. So we pass plot output hist to our fluid page function. And note how plot output is now the second argument to fluid page, so don't forget to add a comma after the first argument. And when we run this app in R, this is what we see. So it doesn't look any different than before we added the output function, which might be a little disappointing. But if you looked at the HTML behind this app, you'd see that there is now an additional div section that creates a placeholder for the R object to appear in our app. But at this point, the app has no idea what to put there. All we've done is we told the app that we want a plot, and we want that plot's name to be hist. But we haven't written any code to create that plot. So we need to tell the app how to build that plot. And that's something we do inside the server function. But before we look at the server function, let's recap uh, what we've gone over so far. You first, you want to begin the app with the template. Then you add elements to the web app by passing arguments to the fluid page function. Uh, you want to create reactive inputs with an input function and create reactive outputs with an output function. And finally, we'll use the server function to assemble inputs into outputs. The second thing you have to do when you build a Shiny app is you have to tell the server how to assemble inputs into outputs. Let's go back to the template. And so this is what the server function looks like. It's an empty function at the moment, so it doesn't do anything. Note that it takes two arguments, input and output both of which are list-like objects that Shiny uses to pass input variables to the server function and pass output objects to the UI. To use the server function, you need to follow three rules. And I didn't make up these three rules. Garrett Grohlman made up the three rules, and I'm just reiterating them here. So, But here are the three rules to write the server function. First, you want to save the objects that you want to display in the output dollar sign object. So this code here is going to save uh, to the hist element in the output list. Remember that the output list is one of the arguments to the server function. So we're adding an element to the output list, and that element is named hist. I'm choosing the name hist for the output list element because this element is going to hold the object that I want to end up in the part of the web page with a placeholder named hist. What this means is you want to use the same name for the output list element here that you would use in the output function, plot output. So in the server function, the name is the name of the element of a list. And in the UI function, the name is the object ID argument to an output function. And this is how we connect the output that we'll generate in the server function to its appropriate place in the UI function. The second rule for using the server function is what you save as an element to the output list should be built using a render function. Shiny provides a third family of functions named render functions because they all start with the word render. 
And render functions work together with the output functions to place an object as HTML into a Shiny web page. You can see that just like for the output functions, there are render functions for different types of output. For example, we have render plot, render table, render text, and a bunch of others. In most cases, it's obvious which render functions you'll want to use with which output function. For example, render plot should be used together with plot output. And here's how you use a render function to create a plot. For now, my goal is going to be to plot a histogram of 100 random normal values. So R norm of 100 is going to is how you make 100 random normal values in R, and hist is how you make a histogram plot. So this code will, in green here, will plot a histogram of 100 normal values. Note how I'm wrapping this code in braces and passing it as an argument to render plot. And this is how you use render functions. All of the render functions have a similar syntax. They all start with the word render, and then the second word in camel case is the kind of object that you want to build. Right now, I want to build a plot. The only argument to a render function is a code block. And this code block contains the R code for generating the object that I want to make. In this case, it's just one line of code to make the histogram of 100 random normal values. To go back to our example, I would build my output object like this. Note that what's highlighted in purple here is the same code as in the previous slide. I've just added some new lines. Uh, it's just one line of code in the code block, but I could add many more lines of code, perhaps building out my plot more or even doing any types of sophisticated computation that R is capable of doing. So you can see how I could build really sophisticated apps in Shiny by adding some very complex logic into the code chunks that I'm using inside of the server function. The third and last rule for the server function is you want to use the input dollar list to access input values inside of your render function. And the input dollar sign list is like the output dollar sign list in that it provides an interface between the UI and server functions. The input dollar list is also the first argument to the server function, as you might remember. The input list contains all the values from the various input fields, sliders, drop-down menu, or buttons that you put into your Shiny app. Uh, remember that we made a slider input in the UI object, and we gave that slider the input ID num. Now in the server function, the value that the slider is set at will be accessible as input dollar sign num. So these input values are special because they always show the current value of the input. So when the slider is set at 25, then input dollar $num is going to be 25. But when the user moves the slider to 50 or 75, the value of input dollar $num will change to 50 or 75 respectively. And when you look up input dollar $num, it would always show you the current input as set by your user. So let's say I want the output now to depend on the value that input dollar $num is currently set to. So I can change the code so that instead of making a histogram of 100 normal values, we let the user use the slider to tell us how many random values to make, and then we'll create a histogram of that many normal values. And all I have to do is to pass input dollar $num as the argument to the rnorm function, and Shiny takes care of the rest. So if you follow the three rules, if you save your outputs in the output dollar object, you use a render function to build the object, and you have the output dependent on input values, then reactivity will occur automatically. And Shiny will work in the background to keep track of your user input and rerun the code and refresh the web page immediately whenever there's a change. So how does reactivity work? So this is what it looks like graphically. So we have our app on the side here. And the first time we launch the app, Shiny runs the code inside of render plot. And that code is hist of rnorm of input $num. And as part of running that code, it's going to connect to input $num and access its current value, which is 25. And Shiny is going to keep track of that connection. If the user comes along and changes the slider from 25 to 27, then the value of input $num is going to be different. When this happens, Shiny will look up all the objects that are connected to input $num 
all the things that rely on that value, and that includes render plot, and it will notify them that they're now out of date. When render plot knows it's out of date, it'll automatically rerun its code to make an up-to-date graph. And in the process, it looks up the, the value of input dollar $num. When it calls input dollar $num, it gets that value, which is now 27. And it uses that value to make a new plot. And then the cycle is ready to begin again. And this is how reactivity works. So let's recap what we just covered. You use the server function to assemble your input values into outputs following these three rules. Number one, save the output that you want to build in the output list. If you do that, the output will be accessible by the UI object. Number two, build the output with a render function. The render function helps assemble the output into HTML and also handles keeping track of dependencies for reactivity. And number three, access your input values from the input dollar sign list and use input values inside of the render function. And if you follow these three rules, Shiny will handle reactivity automatically. So here's the app we just built. You can see it's a, it's a pretty short app. It's only 16 lines. We have the UI function of the server function. Um, I can run it. You can give it 100 normal values or much fewer, maybe like one. That's what it looks like, a histogram of one value. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with reactive programming in Shiny. But instead of taking a deeper dive into Shiny architecture, I want to demonstrate how you would go about sharing your app here at CHOP. To share your app over the web, all you have to do is arrange to replace your own computer, which shares your app locally, with a web server that can share your app over the network. And here at CHOP, the way to do this is deploy your app to the CHOP RStudio Connect server. Now, RStudio Connect is a commercial product made by RStudio. I'm not here to promote it, uh, but I'm only going to go over it because that's the technology we have available to us here at CHOP. So the first thing uh, to note here is that there is a standard way in which your files should be organized. Uh, you should have one directory with every file that the app needs. The most important file here is the app itself, uh, which is the script that ends with uh, a call to Shiny app. And this file should always be named app.uppercase R. And uh, if, if you have any other data files, uh, such as data sets, images, or CSS files, they should all go in that same directory. Yep, you should use this exact name, app.r. So if you're new to using RStudio Connect at CHOP, it'll be a real good idea to take a look at the RStudio Connect Getting Started Guide written by Christian Minnick, um, which is available on the CHOP wiki at this address. Basically, everyone at CHOP uh, has viewing access to the content hosted on our RStudio Connect instance unless the user locked down that specific content. But to be allowed to publish your own content, you'll have to request that by shooting an email to Christian. Is that right? Yeah. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's that. Let's build an app and deploy it. So here's how you create a new Shiny app. I'm going to click on the plus button, uh, Shiny Web App. And it'll ask me what the application name is. I'm going to just call it Test App. And, uh, and it'll just create it in my home directory, which is fine for, for the purpose of this demonstration. And so what you'll see is that it actually created an app uh, and it pre-populated with some text. And this is actually a, a complete Shiny app that we could test out. So, so you'll see a couple of familiar components here. We have library Shiny. We have a UI function, uh, which, which calls fluid page. There's a slider input. Um, there's a plot output. Uh, but there's also a couple of other components here. A title panel, which, which you can use to give your app a title. And in this case, this app looks at a canonical R data set that looks at, the, uh, that looks at this uh, famous old faithful geyser. And uh, so, so they made an app around this. And there's also these layout and panel functions which help you customize the appearance. Now, on, on the server side, you have the server function that creates a plot, and, and it just calls the hist functions. And there's just a little bit of extra logic to calculate the number of bins here. And then we have the Shiny app uh, command to run the app. So we can run this, and this is what it looks like. This is really similar to my demo app. That's not a coincidence. <laughs> and so you can see that there's this interesting bimodal distribution of 
of how long it takes for two eruptions to occur consecutively, and I don't know what the explanation is for this, but it's... Yeah, Stephen, can you also expand this window, like maximize it? Yeah. I sure can. Yeah, so it's like Shiny uses Bootstrap, right, which is mobile friendly. Right. And so it adjusts like, automatically if you're looking at it on like a narrow screen. So that's right. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Bootstrap in a little bit uh, for very briefly, but thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so so maybe I don't want to deploy this app because it's like not really clinically relevant, um, but uh, let's make it a little bit more interesting by looking at a clinical data set. So what I have here is really I've, I've taken this app and I've, I've I've made a few changes to uh, to create the Clabsy app that I did I show in the beginning. So really what I'm what I've done here is I I loaded this Clabsy data set with this command and I changed title panel. Here to say Clapsy data, and then the only other thing I did down here is I replaced the uh, regular histogram with a ggplot command, and I'll be clear why I did that. But this creates exactly the same plot with ggplot instead of uh, base r, uh, and uh, again I use input dollar bins to uh, to tell ggplot how many bins to use. So if I if I run this app, I get the Clapsy data that I, that I showed at the beginning. So, so now let's say that this that we were satisfied. This is an interesting app and should be shared across Chop because many users will want to be able to use how many active lines there are at Chop in a histogram at different user-defined granularity. So we're ready to deploy. So if I want to deploy my app to the R Studio Connect instance, uh, the very first time I do this, I need to do a little bit of legwork. You need to you need to install the RS Connect package. So I'm going to say install packages of R as connect. Ask me, do I want to restart R? That's fine. OK. And now I should be able to publish the app. All I need to do for this is to click on this blue icon here that says publish application. And it will automatically figure out that I want to have these two files in my directory. It automatically figures out that, that, that I, want, I want this to be the title of the app because that's the title of the folder all these, all these files are in. It actually already knows, uh, it remembers the account that I set up for an RStudio Connect. But since you may not have done this before, I'm, I'm going to go through the steps of, adding, uh, of creating a new account. So the first time you do this, uh, you want to click on uh, Add New Account. Um, so I clicked on, uh, I'll go over it, make it clear, Add New Account. I'm going to click RStudio Connect. And then the public URL is rstudio-connect.chop. Edu. And now it'll take me to this screen where um, it's asking me to confirm the connection. So I click connect. Then it'll ask me to uh, put in my uh, username and password. And this is this is just my chop credentials. And now it says connection succeeded. I go back to our studio, and it tells me that you've successfully authorized, uh, and I can click connect account. That's it. So now I can hit publish, and it's deploying. So this is going to take a minute, but you can see um, the progress of the deployment here. And once it's done deploying, uh, it'll helpfully actually send me to that site. So now we're looking at rstudioconnect.chop.edu, and we're seeing my app running on the R Studio Connect instance. Now, how cool is that? That's cooler than the Hello Chop app that we had in the beginning, right? OK, so let's recap sharing. So you want to save the app as in its own directory as app.r. And if you go through the wizard in R Studio to set up an app, then it'll automatically set it up correctly for you. And then to deploy apps to Chop's R Studio Connect, you want to ask Christian for access to publish. Uh, you might have to install the RS Connect package. And then you push the Publish button, and that's really all there is to it. OK, so we have a little bit more time. So let's say you have built a basic app, but you want to make it look a little bit more like uh, like the Chop style guide uh, with its rubric font and the brown, pink, blue, green color scheme. And, uh, and we can do that because Shiny uses a framework called Bootstrap to provide much of the user interface functionality on the web page. And Bootstrap allows you to change the look of a web page by a technology called Cascading Style Sheets, or CSS. Because of this, you can customize the look of your Shiny app simply by pointing it to uh, a custom CSS file. 
And Joe Marizio created a, a CSS file that creates the typeset and colors based on the CHOP style guide. And you can find out more uh, on this page. So, so what we'll really want is to use the Bootstrap 3 theme, which is shown in this link down here. That's, that's what we're going to use. Another resource for styling your apps uh, was created by the good people at the former Office of Clinical Quality Improvement, or OCQI, at CHOP. And it's an internal R package called ROCQI, or Brocky. And it comes with an awesome hex sticker uh, image. And so Rocky provides helpful functions for shop brand styling, as well as for a host of other common analytics workflows. So it's sort of the main internal package at Chop for R. So the Rocky package is actively maintained, and it's available on the internal Chop GitHub page shown down here. Now, if we want to install the Rocky package, note how it says here that you want to install it from Chopran. Now, what's Chopran? Chopran is a repository for internal Chop R packages, so it's similar to CRAN for regular R packages. And this, this page here explains how you can set up your local computer to access Chopran packages, which is what we'll have to do if we want to use Rocky on our own computer. So in our Studio Connect, we don't actually have to do that because it's already pre-configured to, uh, to be able to pull packages from Chopran. So, uh, so we don't have to do it there, but if we want to use it on the local computer for testing, we're going to have to do that. So let's do that right now. If you haven't worked with Chopran or Rocky before, we're going to have to do a little bit of prep work, which I'll show here. We're going to have to install a package called use this. This isn't strictly necessary, but it's going to make our uh, life a lot easier. This makes it easy to do the next step, which is adding the Chopran repository as a source to our R environment. So I'm going to use the use this function called edit R profile. And this will pull up my R profile file, uh, no matter where it's located. Uh, it might be might be a different file on different systems, but this this will this will do it for me, and pull it in here. And and I've already added the Chopran repository to uh, to my profile. But if yours doesn't say it in there, you just want to add these lines, or rather these lines inside of your the options function that's in this file. Okay. So I've, I've done that, and now R tells me that it wants me to restart R for changes to take effect. I can do that. So this is session, restart R. Now Chopran is going to be available as, uh, as one of the repositories that, that install that packages, which is going to look at for packages. Now I can write install that packages of Rocky. So if I don't add Chopper, and I'm going to get an error here, and it'll tell me, oh, I don't know what that package is. But since I installed, since I added Chopper, uh, it'll it'll find that now, and um, now I have Rocky. <laughs> so um, if I want to take a quick look at what's what's actually inside of Rocky, we can go to the packages pane here, a Chop Analytics R package. You can see there's there's a bunch of helper functions for connecting to the clinical data warehouse, for making statistical uh, process control, Schuhart charts, uh, but also things like uh, and the Clapsy dataset, but also things like like helper functions for creating chop colors. And the function that we're going to use here uh, that we're going to be interested in is, is theme underscore chop, which is a ggplot theme for chop data visualization standards. So this is going to make my plots look uh, chop styled. Okay. So now we can edit the script. And what we'll want to do is we want to add the CSS file from Chop Bootstrap to my UI. And the way to do this is by adding a theme argument to my fluid page function. And the theme argument is going to just have the URL of the, of the CSS file. So, so let's find that URL. Again, I want to use Bootstrap 3 because Shiny is at this point, so that's Bootstrap 3, uh, is not uh, compatible with Bootstrap 4. So I'm just going to copy this, paste in here. And remember, don't forget your comma afterwards, because this is, this is just going to be one or more argument as I'm, I'm adding to this, uh, to this function. Now I want to add theme chop to my plot, and this is why I changed to ggplot. And now in order to use this function, I also have to load the Rocky library. But then I can go down here to my ggplot function inside of the server function, 
and just add plus theme underscore chop. Okay, I can save this, run the app, see what happens. And voila, beautiful rubric font and brown, uh, you know, instead of black and isn't that gorgeous? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. And if you want to make your graph blue, and something to it. Yes, please. You go into GM histogram, and then you one of the arguments in GM histogram you say fill equals chop colors, chop underscore colors, yeah, and then quote blue. Oh my gosh! Okay, that's <laughs> that is awesome. Okay, I, I like this. <laughs> I, like the, I like how changing the color of the plaque is like the biggest reaction. Does pink work too? <laughs> yeah, it does. I think I want it pink. Okay, this is awesome. <laughs> All right. So so now now actually my, my app is not until now my app is actually ready for prime time. So I can, yes. can click republish and uh, and just hit publish and it'll deploy my updated version to uh, to our Studio Connect. Um, so if we wanted to use this for dashboarding and we were using stuff that was behind different logins like red cap data or something like how does how does this play with um, things that are somewhat walled off? No, there shouldn't be. I mean, it's deployed on shop servers, right. so as long as it can be accessed through uh, shop right. servers. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, let's say that you have um, a password that you want to use to connect to uh, a red cap server or, or, or your or your lab information system and pull stuff out of that. Now, the way that we handle this is is by having secret environment variables that mm -hmm. we can store inside of the inside on of the, the bars tab. yeah. So uh, so so the um, so you, you'll add your password as an environment variable, and that is the best practice for yep. for that kind of thing. Another thing I want to point out is, so I'm, I'm done with this app. I don't actually think it's all that useful Aww. to the greater CHOP community. So um, so I, if I want to trash my test app to not to pollute the uh, my R Studio Connect instance with test apps, I can I can uh, delete it like this. So to style, we can use the Rocky package and CHOP Bootstrap. Rocky comes from Chopran, and to add Chop Bootstrap, you pass a link to that uh, CSS file as the theme argument, and you can add plus theme chop to ggplot. So see here, I think uh, the best resources to learn more about Shiny. The first one is the uh, Shiny tutorial on the R Studio website. It's a three-part tutorial. The first part covers pretty much what we did today, and parts two and three take a deeper dive into reactivity and customizing the user interface. So I highly encourage all of you who will learn more about how this works to look at part two and part three of that tutorial, and it's really awesome. Garrett is just one of the one of the best teachers out there. And then this is currently under development, but if you view a recording of this talk sometime in the distant future, this will probably be the authoritative resource for Shiny uh, app development, Mastering Shiny. It's currently being written by Hadley Wickham and has already gotten some good stuff in it. So I highly recommend these two resources. And with that, I want to say thank you for sticking around for the full hour. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Cool. Thank you.